Just across the channel from Christiansborg Castle, formerly the King's Palace and today houses the Danish Parliament, visitors in Copenhagen will find the National Museum of Denmark. It is steeped in history going back several thousands of years. Mainly the Danish claim its history, but there are stories from the past of other parts of the world and foreign cultures as well. We are actually now in what we call the Princess Palais of Copenhagen, which was built in the 18th century uh, in order to house the crown prince of Denmark and his wife, the future king and queen of Denmark. They were actually sitting in this room, which is today my office, looking for the crown prince's father in, in the castle on the other side of the water to, to die in order that they, they could enter as new king and new queen. The inside of the Prince's Palais has been modernized and invite the visitor with a friendly and open atmosphere. But one doesn't have to go far before meeting the first piece of evidence of the countless historic treasures that can be found. I think that one of our most popular collections in fact is what we call Danish prehistory. That's where you can see the history of Denmark through archaeological artifacts as far back as uh, 15,000 years ago. Uh, from the very early beginning uh, of, of the introduction of, of, of human beings in this part of the world, uh, the, the, the very old part of the Stone Age, and there you can find some beautiful examples of how they made their stone axes. Uh, from the Bronze Age you might, might also enjoy the um, Chariot of the Sun, uh, which is a very, very magnificent piece of, of worship from that period. And then we have a large collection of, uh, of Roman weapons, which were excavated in the Danish box. They are from the, from the Iron Age, from the Roman period although we were never a part of the Roman Empire. So these are some of the archaeological artifacts. Then we have a large ethnographic department here, which uh, gives um, the visitor the opportunity to, to discover the different parts of the world and the, the interconnections between these parts of the world and Danish history. Going to the Arctic collection, an ancient link between China and Denmark can be found. There are items from Greenland, among which an old Eskimo dress that clearly shows the first inhabitants came from the Chinese part of Siberia. There is also Danish history from around 15,000 years ago and a huge collection of old weapons and tools made out of stone. Most of the uh, items here in this collection uh, come from the uh, older part of the Stone Age, the Hunter Stone Age, and um, here we have different kinds of weapons, artifacts, pieces of art, mainly found during peat digging in Danish peat box, where the conditions for preservation of such items are very favorable. Aside from the obvious purpose of showing a glimpse of what the past actually looked like, the museum also has another purpose. Teaching people not only about Danish history, but also about life in other parts of the world and other cultures. The idea of having a museum, which is today called the National Museum, is in fact to, to enlighten people, to tell people um, about the history not only of Denmark, but of the whole world, because we are in fact an international national museum. Visitors are amazed either by the fine Chinese craftsmanship in the collection, which reveals the hundreds of years trade and commerce were going on between different parts of the world, or they can enjoy the sight of ancient Egyptian caskets and wonder if maybe a mummy is still inside. But the story of the past sometimes can look quite gruesome seen with modern eyes. Prehistoric Denmark was far from being a friendly and peaceful place to live. As far as we know, they were organized in small family groups and we can also tell by the regional differences in the shape of different artifacts that they were more or less uh, living within uh, restricted territories. They had their uh, fishing grounds and hunting uh, places which they defended against other uh, hunters. 
and uh, we see in the graves from that period, the burials, we see it, uh, many signs of um, aggression and hostility. We have uh, finds where people have been shot by arrows or have had serious blows to their skulls. So it was not a, a, a peaceful and a, a friendly uh, period, the, the Stone Age in Denmark, not at all. Tales and legends are, of course, also an important part of what can be seen at the National Museum. Like a big statue of St. George from the 3rd century, who killed an evil dragon to protect a Judean princess. And it is crucial for a modern museum to be able to tell stories in a way for the people of today, not the least young people, can comprehend the past and be interested in the museum at a time with so many different possibilities to gain knowledge and be entertained. It's, of course, very difficult. And we try to be uh, on, on the front line, so to say. Uh, we, we, we try to modernize every uh, special exhibition which we make. We try there to build in uh, new ways of telling stories to especially young people, school pupils. We have a lot of school classes uh, every year here. We have 100,000 school children every year in this building. Uh, and we tell them by the use of iPads and iPhones and, and QR tags and so on. Because what, what really characterizes uh, a good way of running a museum is that you have to keep up with the time you are part of. I mean, you have to tell about the past in a way that the present can understand and get engaged by. The list of historic treasures is almost endless. Walking through the thousands of square meters, visitors can experience old knights in full armor. They can gaze upon gold horns and other gold items dug up from the ground or have a look at the ruined stones where memorial texts were carved into hard rock by Vikings around 1,200 years ago. Moving some hundred years further up in time, one can enjoy the beautiful crafts from people's private homes or have a chance to meet famous cultural personalities like sculptor Bertel Thorvaldsen or H.C. Anderson on an original portrait from the time he was alive. But again, signs show the past was far from being a peaceful time to live in. At the top floor, an exhibition shows artifacts telling one of the most dramatic events in Danish history. Recently dramatized in the Oscar-nominated movie A Royal Affair, it is about the rise and fall of Johann Frederick Struens, who became a queen's lover and was socially raised from being a common doctor to a nobleman with his own shield of arms. He then lost all of it as the affair was discovered and he was taken to a public place to be beheaded, not with a sword as a nobleman would be, but with an axe as a common citizen of that time 250 years ago. The axe can actually be seen at the exhibition. So what you did at the beheading which took place here in Copenhagen was that first you took his coat of arms, his shield, and we show that on the little ring there, which is his signet ring, and you chopped that into four, and therefore denobling him, and then, because he was now not a nobleman anymore, but just a commoner, he could be beheaded by the more common axe. And that was actually a double degradation of him, both of being beheaded, of course, and then also only uh, by axe. One can spend hours walking around the many different collections of the museum. It gives one the opportunity to get an impression of how life was lived on the streets of Copenhagen and in people's private homes. An amazing journey through time is preserved for future generations. Oh, it's very difficult to, to know what happens in such a long period, but I, I, still I do believe it, yes. Because, because we have been here for more than 200 years and our collections go far longer back. So I think that the attraction of having and keeping original artifacts uh, and the knowledge about them will still be there. Being able to see the artifacts up close and in person, almost being able to touch them, will likely continue to attract people for hundreds of years to come.